Hey guys, this is Comic Uno, episode 223, and this show where I review all the comics I've read this week in one show. We go worst pick of the week to best pick of the week and everything in between. So let's get started and talk about Green Lantern's issue 23, which was my number 18. Now, with this issue, we get to see uh, some interesting topics brought up about politics and if Jessica and Simon should really put themselves into the alien affairs, alien political affairs that are going on in this planet. And that's a cool topic. And, and I like the one panel where, or one scene where it's really brought up and you get to see Jessica and Simon interacting. But other than that, I didn't really care for the actual political um, things going on on the planet because I don't have any connection towards these aliens yet. And that's a big uh, fault, I think, of this story arc and why I can't personally um, have a connection with it. So I'm going to give this one two stars. I still feel like the coloring's a bit damp and uh, I do think the artwork improved a bit, but it's still not at its strongest. And I do think it's, be it's because of the coloring as well. So that was number 18. I gave that two stars. Now moving on to number 17, which is X-Men Gold issue 19. Uh, for some reason, these X-Men titles have been on the bottom for me recently and blue and gold, but with X-Men Gold, they were still in this negative zone story arc, which I haven't really been liking the aliens that they've been fighting in about half of the issue. I feel like you really have to care about these aliens if you're getting invested in the fight. But the aspect I did like was the action. I liked the team-up aspect. I think that's uh, one of Mark Guggenheim's strongest aspects of this book, is seeing him um, have Kitty as leader in, in putting... Uh, the other X-Men in, into their missions, I think is really cool to see. But the artwork is kind of lackluster for an issue that's so action-packed. I still don't really like the inking and, and the way the colors collide. So X-Men Gold, for me, gets two stars, and that was number 17. Now moving on to number 16, which is Nightwing issue 26. I was just talking about the, the switch up between Tim Seeley and um, Sam Humphreys. But I, I haven't liked the switch up. I, I feel like they were better in their other titles. And this title I probably will drop. I've been on and off with Nightwing, so this is a little bit of an easier title to drop compared to Green Lanterns. But yeah, I just, I, I really like the inner monologue for Dick Grayson. I think that's interesting, but I don't really like the judge as a villain. Uh, I feel like using the detective in last issue was a really smart move to get you connected and, and to feel for this villain and or this villain hero dynamic, but you don't get the detective at all here. And there's this opening of Nightwing saying, oh, but she's a good cop, she's a good cop. And it's kinda doesn't get touched upon again throughout the issue. Our work is okay for, for the book. I think it fits the tone, but I, I've definitely seen better for Nightwing. So I'm gonna give this one two and a half stars. And now is number 16. Moving on to number 15, which is Spider-Man issue 236. With this issue, it's just, uh, it just doesn't have a lot of substance for me, and it's sad uh, because this is the ending, or we're leading to the ending of Brian Michael Bendis' long run on Miles Morales, a character he created, and uh, a run that I really enjoyed when Miles Morales was in the Ultimate uh, Universe, but I just feel like not a lot's going on here. It's very much just an action issue, and once we do get to the ending where it's revealed that Uncle Aaron's still alive and uh, Miles finds this out, even though we knew about this since the beginning of this arc, so as a reader, you're like, okay, cool. I mean, you kind of expect that Miles and him are going to uh, come face to face and understand each other's um, uh, secret identity. And that's all that's really happening in this issue. And for an action issue, the art is solid, but it's not at its strongest. I think there is a lot of plain moments, especially with facial expressions. So overall, I'm going to give this issue two and a half stars. And that was number 15. Moving on to number 14, which is Deathstroke issue 27. And this was a pretty good issue. The artwork was a little weaker than usual, uh, and I do feel like it's jumping a lot, but the, the character moments are good, especially like Rose and Tara in this issue, because those are characters I really like from the series. Uh, it's always weird to say that Deathstroke's usually the weaker part of this book for me, uh, but when Deathstroke's interacting with the supporting cast, that's where I'm really liking the series. Uh, but again, I do think it jumps a lot. It does a touch upon uh, an origin story that's very, you know, weird, <laughs> uh, which is Terra's origin story with Deathstroke, and it's kind of creepy, as you know, if you you know Terra's character, and they definitely touch upon it a lot in this issue. 
Uh, but overall, I thought it was an okay issue. I do like these supporting characters, but I feel like focusing on one character would have been better for this issue. But I did give this three and a half stars. Now moving on to number 13, which is Injustice 2, issue 17. And this is another uh, issue that I felt like was very scattered, uh, but I feel like it was a bit more cohesive than Deathstroke. Uh, I did really like the, the Harley moment, you know, her letting go of her daughter, but saying, hey, I'll see you again. Don't worry, I'm not going to like completely let you go. Really love her moment with po uh, Poison Ivy, showing uh, what it means to be on these different sides within the Injustice world, being on Batman's side and being on Superman's side, and the different ideologies they have, I thought was very interesting. Uh, the actual... I guess deaths that happen in this issue uh, is a little bit too mysterious for me. I wanted a little bit more answers to feel invested in that portion of the story. But I do love those characters. I love Batman. I love Batgirl in this series and just in general. So I did like those character moments. But I think uh, as we continue, it'll get a little bit more intense as we learn uh, a bit more about the motivations behind that. So I'm going to give uh, Injustice 2, issue 17, three and a half stars. Moving on to number 12, which is Superman, issue 38, which I think is definitely the best of this crossover so far. I am a big Cassie Sandsmark, Bart Allen, Connor Kent fan. I love those versions of the Teen Titans, so it's nice to see these characters again, even if it's not really them, it's like their future selves. But we haven't seen them in DC Rebirth. They've noticeably not been in DC Rebirth, so it's cool to see them back. And I do like, finally, we're kind of getting some more of Tim's motives of why he wants to go up against Superboy and defeat Superboy. And I do feel like the crossover aspect was better done in this issue compared to other issues. I really feel like all titles had a uh, time to shine. Uh, the lackluster part of this issue probably was the beginning. I'm not a huge fan of the current Teen Titans, so their chemistry is a little off for me, especially when you compare it to Cassie and Bart and Connor's chemistry. But overall, I did like this issue. I thought it was pretty solid, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give it three and a half stars. Moving on to number 11, which is Batman issue 38. So this is a little bit lower for Batman compared to where it's been for me. Uh, I do feel like there's a need for this issue because if you like the detective aspect of Batman, you get that in full force in a one-shot type of way in this issue. And the villain's interesting. When you find out this little boy is pretty much has the same origin story as Bruce Wayne, goes a very different path from Bruce Wayne. And I like that. I like the mystery unraveling. Definitely enjoyed the Catwoman and Batman scene where Batman's kind of in detective mode trying to figure it out uh, what's going on in this case while he's in bed with a uh, cat. Cat's completely asleep and she's not listening to him at all. And she's like, yeah, that's good. That's good. And he like walks out. I thought that was definitely the best scene of, of the issue. Our work still very gorgeous for this book. Again, this is a bit of a filler issue. That's why I do have it a bit lower. But if you enjoy the detective side of Batman, it's a fun, fun ride. So I gave this one three and a half stars. Moving on to number 10, which is Rogue and Gambit issue one. I think if I was a bigger Rogue and Gambit fan, this probably would have been like pick of the week, but I am not a huge fan of the characters. Like I like them obviously enough to pick up this mini series and I love Kelly Thompson as a writer, but I've never been a huge like, oh my god, this is like my X-Men couple. Uh, definitely more of Kitty Pride and Colossus uh, and really anybody that Kitty Pride was with. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, Rogue and Gambit, uh, I, I do like the characters though. And, and with this issue, I really enjoy their chemistry. There's a lot of fun, just classic X-Men moments here. Uh, but utilizing, obviously, the modern setting that X-Men is in right now with Kitty being leader. Uh, and I like that. I, I It's fun that they're going on this like couples retreat and... And, and they have to figure out this mystery. Uh, the ending uh, jumps the gun, I think, a lot uh, because they're going into like couples therapy pretty much and you see them trapped. It, it's a funny moment, but I kind of wish we figured out how they got there. But the artwork is gorgeous for this book and it's a really, it's a good setup for the book. And again, I think it depends how much of a fandom you have towards these characters. If you love these characters, I think you'll love this book. If you're kind of more in the middle with me, I think it's more of the, a middle ground book. But I definitely love the writing and the art and definitely gave me enough to want to pick up more. So I'm going to give that three and a half stars. Moving on to number nine, which is Phoenix Re Resurrection issue two. So it's a little lower than issue one, which was my pick of the week last week. Uh, but still a really interesting storyline. Uh, I do feel like the artwork has gotten weaker, though. I, I, I never see the character's eyes open, and that kind of is bothersome. So this book definitely needs a bit more detail in the art department. Uh, but I do like 
the designs. Like, I think that's good. It's like there's good structure there. It just needs to have a bit more detail uh, with the artwork. Uh, and definitely the most interesting aspect of this issue being Jean. Like, why is she this normal person right now? And I like that aspect, seeing an X-Men doing mundane things. You don't really get to see that that often. They're usually on a mission and they're usually interacting with each other. You don't really get to see them interacting with humans as much unless they're superheroes. So I like seeing Jean having this normal life, but obviously her old life creeping in as the Phoenix gets closer and closer. Uh, I did like the scene with Cable putting on Cerebro. I thought that was really cool. There's some slower moments besides that with the X-Men scenes, them still going on missions, but I really enjoyed this issue and I'm, I'm really excited to see where this goes. And I have not been disappointed with Phoenix Resurrection so far. I'm, I'm going to give this one four stars and that's number nine. Moving on to number eight, which is Hawkeye issue 14, which the beginning is a little slow with, uh, again, the supporting characters I usually don't enjoy with Hawkeye. Uh, for some reason, I just feel like they're not very fleshed out. So to give so much screen time to them, I don't think it was necessary. But once you get to see Clint and Kate teaming up, that's when the issue really uh, picks up speed. And, and the emotion that Kate has while seeing uh, her mother and the flashbacks of her mother really makes this issue and the artwork is gorgeous for this book too. Great action, great emotion. I've always really enjoyed the artwork for this series. And I like the ending where Clint obviously, obviously makes the big mistake of like, all right, I'm gonna replace the Madame Mask clone Kate with other Kate. And Kate's like, why did you do that? Now these two villains are gonna team up with each other. So I enjoyed the mistake Clint made and it made for a good cliffhanger. So overall, I gave this one four stars. I thought it was a solid issue. Sad that this series is ending, uh, but I enjoyed this one. So number eight was Hawkeye. Moving on to number seven, which was Batman White Knight issue four. And the beginning is a little jarring with the political aspect that they randomly take with this book because you didn't really get that political in the other three issues. It touched on politics, but not as heavy as it did with this issue. Uh, but it really picks up steam once you get to see uh, Jack challenge the Bat family dynamic, especially between Batgirl and Commissioner Gordon's relationship. And it's still interesting that Commissioner Gordon does not know that's his daughter. I do wonder if Batman White Knight will finally have that dynamic that I've been desperately waiting for just to see that, yes, Comm Commissioner Gordon does know that Barbara is Batgirl. But anyways, uh, I do like how Jack plays with that dynamic and especially my favorite aspect of the issue being Neo Joker, finding out her origins that she pretty much became Harley Quinn out of fear. And I like that it's this average, um, you know, scene you would see in a comic or superhero movie or superhero television show or any really action vigilante uh, thing where there's a bank robbery. The bank teller has to give the money and the bank teller is usually like bank teller number three. You know, she's not important. But here, the bank teller has a story. She becomes the villain of this series. And I thought that was really interesting. It puts all the familiar superhero tropes on its head, which I think Batman White Knight does really well with the Batman mythos in general. So overall, I gave this four stars. Artwork's really solid. It fits the tone of this dark, but morally gray storyline. All right, so moving on to number six, which is probably the highest I've seen Birthright in a while, and that's Birthright issue 29. I just thought this was a really solid issue, uh, especially with the emotions here where Mikey sees how his family was broken while he was gone. And then you get to see a good uh, mix of the fantasy aspect of Birthright and delving into the mythology a bit more. So overall, Birthright was very solid for me, and I gave that four stars. Moving on to number five, which is Harling and Ivy meets Betty and Veronica issue four. I'm surprised to see this so high, but I just had fun with it. I like uh, it's still Betty and Veronica and Harley and Ivy try, trying to live each other's lives. Uh, and then by the end saying, we just want our bodies back. They cannot stand being in each other's bodies anymore. So for me, it was the fun hijinks that really made this issue. Uh, the artwork is pretty good. There's times where facial expressions could be a little better. There's some jarring facial expressions, but I do like the issue. Hopefully the hijinks do end in the next issue though, and we get a little bit more plot, but I, I had fun with this one. So I gave this four stars. 
Moving on to number four, which is Crosswind issue six. And this was a really well done ending for a Crosswind because Crosswind is pretty much Sopranos meets Freaky Friday. And if you've ever seen any body switching storyline from television or comics, usually by the end, it's them learning from each other's lives that they appreciate their own lives. And here, it's the complete opposite. It's Kacen saying, no, I want to still be Juniper. And Juniper is saying, yeah, I guess I could still be Kacen. And them enjoying each other's lives to the end. Uh, I, I do think that some of the mythology aspect, uh, them bringing um, that other character who actually switched their bodies was the weaker aspect of this issue actually, but the actual interaction of Kacen and Juniper in the same room with each other, artwork-wise, story-wise, was really good. Uh, so I'm really excited to see where a sequel will go for this. They do tease it in the end. I, I enjoyed the ending. I like this wasn't a cliche book that it totally could have been because this trope has done been done many times. But I think Gail Simone really puts it in cat stacks, really puts it on uh, its head. Now moving on to number three, which is Paper Girls issue 19. You know I love this book, and this issue, uh, I, I like to see uh, the Paper Girls actor actually interacting with each other. That was a pleasure, uh, even though I do like it when they have their spotlight issues, like KJ, I love that last arc, as you guys know. I like this arc, just focusing on Tiffany, and then, you know, obviously the Erin arc, seeing her future self. I love those stuff, but I also really like to see them bouncing off each other, because Vaughn has some brilliant dialogue work with that. Uh, so... And that's a pleasure to see. And, and obviously the, the best part of this issue, though, being Tiffany, seeing future Tiffany. I love the design that Cliff Chang gives future Tiffany and then being shocked. Future Tiffany, like, throws up on other Tiffany's shoes because, like, what's going on? Uh, and obviously that's a lot of people's reactions to this world. Uh, but also this is a really uh, action-packed issue where we get to see them going up against the villains, or we don't really know who the villains of the story are, but at least at this point, the villains. Uh, and then also bringing back the religious aspect, they go into the church to do this final battle. So really interesting stuff, and it leaves you on a nice cliffhanger as well. So as always, love Paper Girls, and this issue is no exception. So I gave this four and a half stars, and that was number three. Moving on to number two, which is Baby Teeth issue seven. And this was a really well done issue. I love Baby Teeth. It always surprises me, but it doesn't surprise me because it's always good. Uh, but yeah, with this issue, it really focuses on the themes of this book, which is, um, which obviously is motherhood. And we finally get to see Sadie's uh, mother and her background story that Heather is actually not even Sadie's um full sister. She's her half-sister. So Sadie has another father. So who's the father? Does this bring into the mythology? But then you have this parallel of uh, the assassin and him losing his daughter. So you get this interesting storyline about relationships between mother and daughter, but also father and daughter. And you see that between Heather and Sadie when her, where their father gets hurt. And obviously they care for his fa their father because that's the person that, uh, raise them. So a lot of interesting character dynamics with this issue. Uh, and I really just enjoy Baby Teeth. I think, it, again, it was a really nice uh, character issue, but also delves into the mythology a bit more as well, which is also important for Baby Teeth. So I gave this issue four and a half stars, and that is number two. Now moving on to number one, which is Secret Weapons issue zero. Uh, this was such a pleasant surprise for me. I just recently gotten into Valiant. It, it was kind of hard for me to jump into some of the other books, but now I really feel like they have a lot of good jumping off points uh, with Bloodshot Salvation, which I've been really enjoying, and now Secret Weapons. And I read this preview a couple, maybe a month ago or a couple of weeks ago on Newsarama, and I said, wow, that grabbed me. I can't wait to pick this up. And it's issue zero. And this is issue zero done right. It, you don't need to read the Secret Weapons miniseries, which I actually am going to read after this because I really liked issue zero. But it's a fresh storyline that makes you want to pick up those previous issues, but also wants um, makes you want to pick up even more from this. So I really liked it. I love the structure of this issue where the the writer is a screenwriter. He, he wrote uh, the movie Arri Arrival, which I also really enjoyed. And you get to kind of see that cinematic uh, way of storytelling with this book as you see the, the character's life uh, throughout um, 
uh, throughout months, throughout weeks. It, it's told within um, in a day format. So I really enjoyed that. You get to see a peak of her life uh, throughout these days and how she changes physically and emotionally as she learns about these abilities and, and tries to get these abilities. And then she finds out that her abilities are kind of disappointing. She talks to birds. Uh, she never really says they're disappointing, but you can tell that she's a bit disappointed. Uh, so I like it. You know, I really liked it. And I like that this... Um, it was a really well done character piece uh, where you see her journey and how, again, how she changes physically and emotionally with this book. But you see that she's a regular kid. She's a theater geek. Love a lot of theater <laughs> references with this. You had uh, um, Fun Home, which actually was a comic. You had Les Mis. I really enjoyed that throughout the, the whole book. But yeah, she was a theater geek. She was a gymnast. And then, you know, she had a boyfriend. Uh, she broke up with her boyfriend after all. Well, the boyfriend broke up with her. Uh, you know, she lost contact with her friends. She lost contact with her parents. It was just a very interesting journey. And you get a big scope of this character with just this one issue. And again, it makes you want to follow more with this character, which is exactly what issue zero should do. So overall, I gave Secret Weapons uh, four and a half stars. And that was my pick of the week. Hopefully you guys enjoyed. This is Comic You Know. Don't forget to follow me on Twitter. Don't forget to like my Facebook page. Also, description below, there are links to my comic book, Like Father, Like Daughter. And don't forget to like the Facebook page of Like Father, Like Daughter. And I'll see you guys later. Bye.